here and on today's video we've got something a little different for you uh we've got a special guest on the channel someone i'm very excited to talk to the folks over at grindhouse releasing were good enough to get us together so we can have this conversation yes it's the one the only david worth director cinematographer dp actor did I say writer already? You're pretty much just a jack of all trades. You do it all. So thank you so much for, for agreeing to do this interview. I, I really appreciate it. My pleasure, Lizzie, totally. I'm, I'm so grateful to Bob Morowski and everyone over at Grindhouse for getting the little film that I worked on way back in <laughs> 1970s finally completed. Got it right here. That's it. That's it. <laughs> Yes, this was great. They they were good enough to send me um, the Blu-ray and um, I checked it out and I looked through some of the extras, read the liner notes, and um, I was so impressed by this movie and, and shocked that more people didn't know about it or had seen it because I was familiar with Eli Roth's remake and stuff. Yes. And, and, um, and I guess he's been a, a, a big proponent of this movie as well. Yeah, we have to thank Eli. It's very special and uh, tip of the hat and thank you to Lee, Eli for getting the word around on Death Game, for doing the remake and saying how the remake was inspired by Death Game and getting the interest up in Death Game mm -hmm. so that it finally, after 40 years, got completed. That's awesome. How did you come to work on this movie? Oh, that's, that's way back in the in the... <laughs> middle of the last century let me see if i can uh, <laughs> if i can go back that far mentally rewind the clock uh, a little bit <laughs> okay yeah no i had done a feature with uh, shelly winders and leslie Adams and slim pickens and Dub taylor and ted cassidy called poor pretty eddie mm -hmm. starring michael christian in the starring role and the producer had seen it and we uh, the producer um Larry Spiegel had seen it, and we said, well, we'll work together sometime. You know how that is. Mm -hmm. And about six months later, I get a call from Larry, and he says, um, the director just fired the cinematographer on this little film I'm doing. Would you like to come and take over? I paused because I didn't want to inherit someone else's problems. Mm -hmm. So I delved a little further and said, well, who's in it? And he said, Sandra Locke, Seymour Cassell, and Colin Camp. Well, that light bulb would immediately went on in my brain because Sandra Locke had received an Academy Award nominee for her first film, Heart is a Lonely Hunter. Mm -hmm. Seymour Cassell had received an Academy Award nomination for her his work with John Cassavetes in Faces. And Colleen was a new vivacious young star. So uh, I, I reluctantly agreed. I signed on and... It, I discovered that we only had 13 days left to shoot this film. So uh, fortunately, it was most of it was all in a house in Hancock Park in Los Angeles. We later went to San Francisco for a weekend and shot exteriors there to place it in Northern California. But mm -hmm. it's basically all done in Southern California. So I signed on and we did it in 13 days. There were 16, 18 hour days. But it was it, it had its problems, but we got it all done, and it was it was a great experience working. My work with Sandra is what eventually led me to Clint Eastwood. So that that's why this film is so important to me. Mm -hmm. it, I learned so many things and had so many connections with the rest of my life on this film. I, I, I'm ever I'm ever grateful to Larry Spiegel and to Death Game and to Peter Trainer for financing it. It's great just a great experience well it was it was a very small cast really it was just the the two girls and and the guy and there was such their performances especially Sandra Locke and Colin Camp are so chaotic uh, and just yes. manic and crazy was it difficult to keep that energy going on set throughout the shoot not really. Those girls were just fantastic. This was at the beginning of their career, so they had mm -hmm. all the energy in the world, and they brought it to those parts, and they just gave and gave and gave. Whenever we said action, they would do. They would just go crazy. It was just fan it was fantastic for me to witness. So it was it was really a, a thrill to watch those two girls work. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you got very close. I saw the picture of you in the hot tub with the big camera. <laughs> That's yes. one of my favorite pictures. <laughs> yes, thank you. Well, you know, I always, I, as a director and cinematographer, I always said, never ask your actors to do something you're not willing to do. That's a so the actors were naked in the jacuzzi, so I stripped off all my clothes, <laughs> but the camera and got naked in the jacuzzi too, just yeah. so they wouldn't feel uh, that I was, uh, you know, taking advantage of them. And it turned out mm -hmm. great. I mean, uh, you saw from the picture, that was yes. uh, that was the first time I'd used the Panavision Panaflex camera that yeah. I'd been dying to use for years. And it's so ergonomically correct and so well balanced that it's mm -hmm. just like a big 16 millimeter camera. I loved it. And I was able to put a thousand foot magazine on the back and a 75 millimeter lens on the front and a plus two diopter to get the very extreme close up mm -hmm. to the actors and just get in and do it. It was it was really a thrilling scene. No, that was great. It was so it, it made it so intimate and and just it helped with that crazy energy to get those extreme close ups. Yes, it, it really lent well to that. Well, with those performances, I mean, they're smashing things, they're breaking things and throwing things. They threw a cat out the window, which I hope was a fake. <laughs> I hope it was yeah. a fake cat. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes, yes, it was. It was, it was all done in the editing. <laughs> Did anyone get hurt? Uh, no. Seymour uh, Cassell's feelings were hurt and he wanted to punch out the director. Yeah. But that's, that's, a, that's another story. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask because you... You dubbed his dialogue. You were his. Yes, I, I unwittingly dubbed his dialogue because I had a SAG card and Peter, the director, said, well, Seymour is not going to come in and do his, his, his uh, ADR, so you have to do it. And I, I rolled up my sleeves and did it. Uh, you know, this was very early in my career, and I would do anything to keep working. I would mm -hmm. do anything to do. I, that's why I started out doing cinematography, doing editing. I started out as just a cinematographer on this film and about mm -hmm. six weeks after it had been finished, Peter called and asked Sandra and I to come and look at a, a first cut. It was horrendous. Really? It was awful. Sandra sat there the whole time like this. Oh no. She didn't even want to look at it, she didn't want to see it. I'm all doing the screening, I'm saying, where's this shot? Where's that shot? Where's this shot? Mm -hmm. So. After the screening, I had Peter, the director, take Sandra and I and the work print back to the editing room. And I was able to go on the editing rack and find mm -hmm. several shots that I was speaking about and put them in and show him how to make the scenes better. And he immediately fired the editor. And that's how I became the cinematographer and editor on the show. It didn't start out as that, mm -hmm. but the job was, had been done so badly that I had to fix it for Sandra's sake. And Sandra said, you know, you've got to make this look professional, David. That's my face up there. And I promised her that I would. And I did. And we made it look as professional as possible. Mm -hmm. and, and it turned out that it was good for her and for me. And she went on to do the Outlaw Josie Wales with Mr. Eastwood. One of my favorite scenes in the film is the, the trial scene where they've got Seymour, you know, tied up by the fireplace and there's that green ambient glow from the fish tank and Sandra's got that makeup on. And so it almost <laughs> looks like a death mask, you know, and she yeah, looks very yes. menacing. How did you, yes. how did you achieve that look? Uh, I just, I just photographed what was set in front of me. Yeah. Sandra and Colleen did the makeup, you know, they came mm -hmm. up with the idea for the makeup when they were at the, at the wife's makeup table upstairs tearing that all apart. And that was a funny scene. <laughs> but then I said, uh, I just, I just uh, had a light with a green filter on it that I used to shine through and around the fish tank to give that strange look mm -hmm. after, they, they, after they murdered the delivery boy and put him in the fish tank. Uh, I thought that was a, a, a big turning point. So I let, the, I let the cinematography go into that kind of green direction. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it, was very, it was very simply done. The whole film was done very simply. I lit, I lit it entirely with lights that I could just uh, put on a stand and move around very quickly inside the, uh, inside the house 
or from the outdoors with a, a big 10K to do the lightning strikes. But it was, it was quite a, a, a cutting edge, independent and a simple production. Mm -hmm. And I, I looked at a couple other interviews that you did in um, right now, Grindhouse releasing the Lyroth. They're going around with the movie, playing it as a double feature with Knock Knock at several theaters around the country. Yeah, great. Was, was this the first time that you saw it on the big screen? Yes. Wow. It only took me 40 years. Only 40 years. <laughs> only 40 years of patiently waiting and talking it up behind the scenes. And I knew that at one point, uh, uh, the, the Stallone was interested, one of the Stallone boys was interested in it. And it was, mm -hmm. I kept my eyes out for it always. Yeah. Because uh, I, I, only, I only had a bad VHS of copy of it. It was awful. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to see it finished. I wanted to see it on the big screen. And I wanted to see it in anamorphic widescreen the way it was shot. Mm -hmm. And thank God we had someone who's a genius like Bob Murawski, who had also done uh, the last Orson Welles film, Other Side of the Wind, had gotten it a release involved. And he just did a marvelous job in, in uh, crossing all the uh, T's and dotting all the I's and, mm -hmm. and making it a wonderful uh, post-production. Yeah. And... You've had a very prolific career. I mean, you've been in the movie business for what, 50 years now? Yes, yes. <laughs> um, and, and you've worked on so many different types of productions from those smaller independent movies and then to studio films with people like Clint Eastwood and, and Jean-Claude Van Damme. Um, and you're still working today doing films. And yes. So in your opinion, how has the the movie production business changed? It has become totally democratic and it has become totally high definition. And it is a revelation. The little movie that I worked on in December, uh, Borrowed Time 3, mm -hmm. uh, happened because I'm a guy contacted me 10 years ago with the little martial arts films that he was shooting in the, in the alleys of Paris. And I liked what I saw and I liked his spirit and I started mentoring him. Mm -hmm. And I mentored him and gave him notes on his filmmaking and et cetera, et cetera. And he kept going, he kept doing better and better. And finally, he's, he's, he did films that he, he brought his productions to America. He got Eric Roberts and, and other uh, co-stars in, involved. and. Uh, I was thrilled to see his growth. And so I was thrilled to help him out on this little film. Mm -hmm. And now then, that little production, I can't tell you how thrilled I was to work on it because the camera was a black magic camera that fits literally in the palm of your hand. Compared to the and big. Have, <laughs> that's right. And the other one was a drone that fits in the other hand. Mm -hmm. And that was how we made the film. No, all practical and available light. And it looks absolutely fantastic because that's what you could do today with a camera like this. Yep. This is what Steven Soderbergh now shoots on. Yep. <laughs> so that's what's happened to film production. Since I, when I started back in the last century, you had to have trucks full with lighting and grip equipment and sound equipment and, mm -hmm. and all kinds of things, all kinds of people on the crew. Now you can literally make a film uh, Alan Delabi and his uh, and his wonderful cinematographer came from came from Europe with a backpack with the camera and the drone and a and a wireless microphone in it and that's how the film was made. Wow, it's just incredible what you can do these days. You yes. know, every, everyone can make a movie if they want to. Yes, that's what I'm thrilled about. It's mm -hmm. it's it everyone can't, but everyone can. Yes, they that's, have the... <laughs> that's they have the ability. They may not have the talent, but they have the yeah. ability. And mm -hmm. I like seeing all of those uh, efforts. I, I really applaud them, and I'm happy to to mentor anyone that I can uh, in their pursuit of making a film because it's no longer the impossible dream. In the last century, it was the impossible dream because mm -hmm. you literally needed hundreds of thousands of dollars and a lot of equipment and people. Now you can do it with imagination. Mm -hmm. And just with uh, with high def cameras and drones and available practical lighting. 
Yeah, it's it's pretty incredible. Um, going back to uh, your movies in earlier in your career, like uh, Poor Pretty Eddie and Death Game, and then you went on to do Bloodsport and Kickboxer and the films that you did with Clint Eastwood. Uh, what was the difference on set between those two kinds of movies? Well, you know, the, the difference on set isn't isn't really that vast, whether mm -hmm. it's Clint or Jean-Claude Van Damme or Sandra Locke uh, in a low budget film. Mm -hmm. uh, the difference is behind the camera with the amount of people and the amount of uh, extras and the amount of uh, props and wardrobe and equipment, that's, that is the, but, but what happens on camera is very similar. Mm -hmm. It's either a close up of Clint or John Claude or Sandra, it's how many people are behind, behind the camera. That's what adds to the, to the budget. And I just love the fact that it's simpler now. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I listen, I wouldn't trade the, my experience with Clint was, I always tell everyone that was my PhD in filmmaking. Mm -hmm. the year that I spent with Clint, because I discovered that Clint Eastwood, whose name is chiseled in granite as the star of stars and director of directors in Hollywood, mm -hmm. worked as fast as or faster than I worked. Really? He was just astounding. 75% of the time, Clint would either print the rehearsal or the first take, which made all the actors like this. Right. He was on their toes. Well, I'm not going to get more than one tick. I got to be ready for Clint. Mm -hmm. And all the people behind the cameras the same. So he found that way of working, kept everyone involved and engrossed in the project instead of sitting around trading stories and sipping coffee. So that worked beautifully for us. Mm -hmm. uh, and I had, I have to deter back to Death Game for a second because oh. that. Mm -hmm. On the editing of Death Game, I learned the most valuable lessons I've ever learned in filmmaking. And it came because I was doing the soundtrack for Death Game. I was placing each actor's performance on a different thousand foot reel so the sound mixer could equalize it for the sound mix. Mm -hmm. And in between the actor's performance back in the day, you had to put something called fill leader, which was old 35 millimeter prints of films that you cut into the soundtrack to keep everything in sync. So we were, I was running out of film leader, film leader, and I called MGM Labs and I said, please send me another box of film leader. I went in on Saturday away from all the cacophony of the office to get this kind of busy grunt work. I had my mm -hmm. box of film leader, I opened it up and what had the gods of production sent me? A print of Clockwork Orange. No. A 35 millimeter print of a clockwork orange. Well, that was not going to be a fill leader. I said, uh, I called and had another box of fill leader sent. I immediately took all my work off of the old 35 millimeter editor, Moviola, and put all of Clint's East, uh, put all of Stanley Kubrick's work on and began running all my favorite scenes in a clockwork orange. I had been a fan of this film for years. Mm -hmm. Because when it first premiered on Hollywood Boulevard back in 71, I was first in line. I have ticket number 0001. Really? <laughs> That's amazing. And then I, when, I, when I saw what I had, I, I kept it and I bought ticket number 0002 to go and see the movie. <laughs> well, I had, I had been a fan of this film ever since I'd seen it. But I couldn't study it because it would just go through. It would be mm -hmm. screened in the projector and it was done. The, projectors wouldn't go back and show you your favorite scenes or favorite reels because this is long before dvds and vhs or anything mm -hmm. all you had all the only way to see a film was to go to a screening That's so incredible. now i had it now i had it in the editing room up close and personal and i began running it reel by reel scene by scene forward and back in the movieola and i was in heaven i was just in fanboy heaven because i thought stanley kubrick was the great greatest directors ever. So I come to the scene, are you familiar with Clockwork Orange? Yes, yes, I love Kubrick, yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I come to the scene where little Alec kills the cat lady with the sculpture of the giant phallus. Mm -hmm. I'm running in the scene, all of a sudden I hit the brake and I go, what the fuck is this? 
I realized I started running it slowly backward, forward, back. I said, mm -hmm. wait a minute. I can see that Mr. Kubrick is using like a 16 or 18 or 14 millimeter lens on his handheld Aeroflex and going 360 degrees around this room. And I can see all four walls, the floor and the ceiling, and there are no movie lights. No lights. No movie lights. This blew my fucking mind. <laughs> I was like, this, this, what's this? How did he do this? <laughs> this is not a student film or a Roger Corman production. This is a big Stanley Kubrick production of a Warner Brothers feature mm -hmm. that had been nominated for four Academy Awards. So I quickly rewound the scene and started stopping it wherever I saw the lights. And I discovered that he had brought in a four or five light sculptures one in the shape of a spiral, mm. one in the shape of a Christmas tree, others in bunches, placed them around the room, plugged them into the wall socket and said, I am lit. <laughs> epiphany of epiphanies. Yes. Epiphany of epiphanies for me. <laughs> this was amazing. This was being mentored by Stanley Kubrick himself and seeing how he did his filmmaking. And this was a huge a huge revelation for me. It changed my entire way of working as a cinematographer and director. Mm -hmm. And I adapted this as the only way of, of really the most practical way because it was actor friendly and production friendly. Well, yeah, you're not spending all that time setting up lights and, and doing all this setup every time people change and saves you I so had much seen, time. I had seen directors of photography be working with an actor, a, a director, and the director's done shooting this. He says, okay, I want to look the other way. And the cinematographer says, okay, give me two hours. <sighs> two hours to look at Stanley Q. Somebody probably said that to Stanley and he X'd that out. He said, no way. And he designed a way to work building his lights into the sets or locations I started studying all of his films after that. I found it in Dr. Strangelove. I found it in Barry Lyndon. Mm -hmm. I found it in 2001, A Space Odyssey. And of course, in A Clockwork Orange, that had been my revelation. Mm -hmm. And I realized that he had solved this problem of turning around years ago. And now I discovered in this century, people like Alfonso Cuaron and Emmanuel Lubisky and uh, the great director who did... Uh, who did the two films with, uh, about um, the, the, the Dallas Buyers Club and Wild. Yes. It worked exactly that way, exactly the same way. So Mr. Kubrick was the first one. He was doing it back in the 1970s. I used it and that's what I brought to Bronco Billy with Clint Eastwood. Mm -hmm. I brought the fact that I, the Kubrickian lighting that I discovered and I brought that we had a huge circus tent in Bronco Billy. And but the two between the two tent poles, I had a, a, a pipe with a T on the end going for the for the width of the tent and a pipe for the length. And I put all my lighting up there and I was lit. So that's incredible. I, that's what that's what I brought to Bronco Billy. I brought Mr. Kubrick's lighting and I would I used it throughout the film so that Mr. Eastwood, he could come in and shoot in any direction. Mm -hmm. And I never had to stop to for him to turn around and shoot in the other direction. If it was a bar, I just hung hoods with 150 watt bulbs in a, in, a room, in a hotel room. I just put practical lamps around. Mm -hmm. And as a result, Clint is the most efficient director I've ever worked with. And he always comes in two or three days under schedule. On Bronco Billy, we didn't come in two or three days under schedule. We didn't come in a week under schedule. We came in two and a half weeks under schedule because of this way of lighting. Oh. And that was enough for Clint to say to me, why don't you hang around for a few right? weeks and start, start, start up another production? <laughs> so so uh, I that that again, that all goes back to my work on Death Gate. Death mm -hmm. Gate was such a pivotal film in my life, teaching me, having me learn about Stanley Kubrick's lighting technique as mm -hmm. well as doing the cinematography and directing on that film. That's just incredible. And you, you were talking about the, um, you know, just building the lights into your set. 
when yes, that's a must. That's a yes. must. Yes, and um, I think you mentioned in a in an interview previously that that's what you did for blood sport. Yes, that was the reason why we were so successful with blood sport. Also, because we had a again we had a four wall mm -hmm. set with floor and ceiling for the kumite in a in a uh, sound studio in Hong Kong. I walked in, I looked at that, I went, "How the hell?" <laughs> And then I saw the beams in the ceiling and I said, okay, 1K, 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 1K. Mm -hmm. And again, we got all the lighting up off the floor into the ceiling. And that was 90% that was of lighting uh, blood sport. And it enabled us to work again. We could shoot three cameras wide and then three cameras tight, then go handheld on the map mm -hmm. and do 75, average 75 setups a day with a high of 93, which was a record I thought I would never break, but I broke it in 2000 and 1995. I broke it in 1995 on a film called True Vengeance that starred, that starred Daniel Bernhardt, mm -hmm. who, had, who went on to star in Matrix. And also, did you see Atomic Blonde? Yes. He's the guy that has the knockdown drag out fight with Charlie Theron and Atomic Blonde, the blonde. He oh. is a brilliant actor, director, second unit director, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant young man. I I had him in as the star of uh, the film we did, uh, uh, True Vengeance in the mid 90s. Mm -hmm. And the stunt coordinator on that film was the man who directed the John Wick series. Really? Yeah. That's some of the, be that's some of the most incredible stunt work I've ever seen. Is this yeah, phenomenal. Yeah, Chad Stahelski, I love Chad. He was just brilliant. He was brilliant on True Vengeance as a stunt coordinator and went on to do the most fantastic, fantastic work mm -hmm. on, uh, on the, the, uh, the uh, John Wick series. I just loved it. Yeah, it was, it's, yeah, it's phenomenal. And you've done quite a bit of action and martial arts stuff. You've worked with Jean-Claude Van Damme. You've worked with Cynthia Rothrock. A joy, Cynthia, a joy, a treasure, a treasure to work with, yes. And she, she's such a, a unique figure in the martial arts world. I, I think it's a shame that she did not get a bigger career, yes. and a more mainstream she should have, career. She should have had a bigger career. Mm -hmm. and, and it just wasn't in the cards. I'm, that's, a, that's a shame. He's brilliant. She's the most hardworking person I've ever worked with on, on set. She, she's there to do all the emotional work and they're mm -hmm. fall in the dirt and do all the fighting out in Indonesia. It was hard. Those were hard films to make in Indonesia. Mm -hmm. And she was just, uh, I always just tell, tell anyone who's interested that all of the pampered actors in Hollywood with their trailers and their lattes could take yeah. a lesson in humility and hard work from Ms. Cynthia Rothrock. Yeah, she, she is incredible. Um, and we've talked a little bit about your work with Jean-Claude Van Damme. Um, a lot of people that watch my channel know I'm a big fan of his. <laughs> Great, me too. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and you worked with him on two films pretty much back to back, Bloodsport and Kickboxer. How, right. did, how did those both of those films for you come about that work? I was doing second unit uh, with a great second unit director, uh, Glenn Randall, who had done the, uh, the Raiders of the Lost Ark series as second mm -hmm. unit director. I was working with him on a film called Inner Space. Love that movie. Yeah, I love that movie too. And uh, I got a call to go over and meet somebody, uh, meet a producer uh, at the Canon because they were looking for a cinematographer and this is after I'd done two films with Clint and the director was Newt Arnold. And Newt, I loved Newt because he'd worked with Billy Friedkin and, and, uh, uh, and the director of The Wild Bunch too. Oh, Sam that's Peckinpah, just, yeah. Sam Peckinpah, so I loved Newt and we hit it off right away and that's how I got the job. Mm -hmm. I, in fact, I Newt knew that I worked with Clint. He may have even talked with Clint to check me out and Clint said, yeah, take yeah, it. he's good. <laughs> so, that's how I got that film. And then 
it was a long, hard production. We shot for yeah. over 45 days, all in Hong Kong, 250,000 feet of film. Wow. And we got it all done. And then that film happened. And now during the production, I kept saying to the producer, you should use me as the director on the next one. And I kept hounding him about it. And eventually when the next one came about, when the script was there, he brought me into the offices and said, okay, I'm not gonna pay you, but I want you to prove to me that you're the guy to do this. So I did, I began storyboarding and uh, uh, doing all the pre-production that, that I could do, uh, casting, et cetera, et cetera. And eventually uh, we didn't have John Clutch when we were casting for a replacement. Hmm. to 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 take John to take over for John Claude if he didn't agree but he eventually agreed and he did it and we went off to Hong Kong and did Kickboxer and uh and I can go back through Kickboxer and I can go to my storyboards and 75 80 percent of the time every scene is exactly the way I storyboarded when I was doing the pre-production in Century City in Hollywood mm -hmm. Uh, one of my favorite um, scenes is in that movie is the ending battle, um, the ending yes. fight with the glue and the crushed glass and all that yes. kind of stuff. Yes. And I just love the look of of that scene because it's 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 lit so well and it's but it's still dark and and in, the camera's rotating around and and I just love yeah, how you, you achieved the look of that scene. Thank you. It's a brutal scene. Mm -hmm. I also like kick the tree. Yes. Oh, That's that one's favorite. hard. It's that one's hard to trick. watch. <laughs> yeah. Oh yes, yes. Big, big Jean Claude Van Damme movie or fan. Excuse me. Um, and I was again, like I said, I, I listened to a couple of other interviews that you did, um, and you had mentioned that you had some theater experience, and I was a little curious. Oh, yes about what oh, your yes. theater experience is, because I've done quite a bit of theater myself. Oh, that's wonderful. That's just, <laughs> that's, that's just wonderful training mm -hmm. as an actor, as a, as a director, as anything. I go all the way back to the first thing I did uh, back in when I was uh, a, uh, about a freshman or sophomore in high school. Mm -hmm. I happened to be home one afternoon and just alone, I'm flipping around and I and something comes on called Citizen Kane. I don't know why I stopped, but I stopped and I got involved and I watched it from beginning to end and it made a change in me. Subconsciously, it changed my direction from not knowing what I wanted to do mm -hmm. to saying I want to do something like that. Yeah. And so I went out the next year, I, I, I went out for the, the senior play and, uh, and did that, uh, played Barnaby in The Matchmaker. Then I, uh, I, I, then I did a couple of uh, religious films mm -hmm. as an actor. And the second one took me to the West Coast. And uh, after it, uh, one of my co-stars was going to Cerritos Junior College down in Southern California. I hitched a ride with him. I went in and I signed up to the theater department in Cerritos Junior College. And I did uh, Under Milkwood and JB and uh, uh, No Exit mm. as a star and eventually as a director. So I had a lot of experience in theater. And then that led me to, uh, again, after junior college was over, that led me to transfer to UCLA and study filmmaking, et cetera, et cetera. But I love theater. Theater is a great testing ground. Yes, it is. Because I... that's, that's, that's the hardest job for actors, because in movies, we can stop and do it over. Right. In theater, <laughs> the curtain goes up, and you that's it. That's it. No cut, no cut for two hours. Nope. You're, you're just out there. <laughs> that's right. Um, with all the different things you've done, acting, writing, directing, cinematography, which one do you enjoy the most? I enjoy the entire process of yeah. filmmaking. And it's like trying to choose them on your children. I can't <laughs> do it. I have, I, I, I love the writing and the shaping and the imagining of it. Then I love the pre-production of it and getting the actors to the locations. Mm -hmm. I love the production. I love the cinematography, the lighting, the directing, 
then my favorite part really of everything is when all that goes away and it's just you and the material and the editing room. Mm -hmm. So I guess if I had to choose, I'd say the editing was my favorite because that's where the film is made. Mm -hmm. One question I did have, I was looking through your resume and um, some of your earlier writing credits are under a different name, Sven Conrad. Uh -oh. I, was, <laughs> I was curious where that name came from. <laughs> it came from my two favorite cinematographers, Sven Nikvist and Conrad Hall. Okay, I was just a little and curious that was about my that. <laughs> nom de plume. That was my nom de plume for doing adult entertainment. Gotcha. <laughs> I was just curious about that. <laughs> no problem. Uh, do you have plans to, do you have any, any writing projects in the works right now? Well, during the lockdown last year, I actually took, I had done several textbooks and I went back through all my textbooks and uh, updated them with photographs from the internet uh, and turn them into coffee table books. Uh, so one of them is very pricey. One of them is about a hundred dollars <laughs> and the rest are, 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 are okay. But that one is called Milestones in Cinema, 50 Visionary Films in Filmmaking. And it traces all the important films from D.W. Griffith's film Intolerance through the silent era, through Potemkin, through Napoleon, through John Ford's The Grapes of Wrath, through Orson Welles' Citizen Kane, through Stanley Kubrick, all the way down to Sean Baker and uh, Tangerine. Uh, oh, yes. You seen Tangerine? Uh, no, I haven't yet. I've, I've heard really great things about because they shot that whole thing on a phone, didn't they? On an iPhone 5. Two yes. iPhone 5s with an anamorphic lens on them. It is brilliant shot in less than two weeks, all on natural locations with available or practical light in Hollywood with transgender non-actors. Brilliant, 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 brilliant film. I put it up there with Bicycle Thief and Breathless and John Catastrophe's film Shadows. I add it to those three to make mm -hmm. Tangerine one of the important non-union independent films ever made. It's incredible. Brilliant filmmaking. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Before we uh, end our conversation, I want to talk about your newest project. <clears throat> Borrow Time 3. Borrow Time 3, um, because you, you, you had just flown out for the premiere, and then you just got some really great news this morning um, from the Inst Istanbul Film Awards. Yes, uh, Alan Dlabi and I were selected as Best Director, and he got Best Actor and also Best Action. So uh, that, 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 that's a very small film. That's a very small independent film that happened because Alan contacted me over 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. He was a martial artist. He had, he would, he'd won awards doing nunchucks, <laughs> and he was trying to make movies in the streets of Paris. And of course, he knew I'd done blood sport and kickboxer, mm -hmm. and he sought me out and found me and began to email me and send me his work. And I, I mentored him because I saw the talent. Yeah, I saw the drive and the persistence and the talent, and I wanted to see him uh, accomplish it, to, to really see him become somebody in the film industry. And over the years, he added more and more things, and he mm -hmm. eventually came to America. He got people like uh, Patrick Kilpatrick and... Uh, and, he's uh, he's great. He is so good at playing a villain. He is yes. just he's just great. He's yes, so, and, so and dynamic on screen. Eric Roberts and uh, lots of people involved, and uh, I, I I he brought me in to direct uh, co-direct uh, the film with him, and the direct the scenes that we did in Los Angeles this last uh, December, mm -hmm. and I was just thrilled to be a part of it because it is cutting edge independent films. The whole film, all the equipment for the film was in a backpack mm -hmm. carried by Lewis, the cinematographer and editor and sound man and camera operator and drone operator. The mm -hmm. drone, the wireless mics, the camera, the black magic camera, all were in his in backpack. In the backpack. You Compared to all trucks of... and trucks. And That's right. People this is moving cutting... stuff everywhere. <laughs> this is the best kind of cutting edge independent film I have ever seen. And I'm thrilled that Alan included me 
into that mix because that's what I've been a champion of ever since I saw Breathless back in the day and mm -hmm. Bicycle Thief way back in the day. And I saw the handwriting on the wall for this was how films could be done in the future. That's excellent. Well, I, I don't want to take up too much more of your time. This has been, this has been so much fun. I, I would love to talk to you all day. <laughs> You can talk to me all as long as you want to. You can really <laughs> you, can, you, can, you, you can you can get more questions and come back for part two. I'm happy. Definitely, to chat with I you. would love to have you back because I, I I definitely will have more questions for you because it's it's great that 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 you take time out of your I'm sure busy schedule to talk with with movie lovers and also people who who appreciate and love your work and and is an inspiration to them for their own work. I'm thrilled. Lindsay, I am thrilled that you noticed. You know, when you get to be a certain age in the film business, people kind of brush you off. I, he's yesterday's news. Mm -hmm. Well, I am still today's news because I just worked on a film that was shot out of a backpack right? with a black magic <laughs> camera and a wireless mic and a drone. So I am more than yesterday's news. I'm today's news and I want to be part of it as mm -hmm. long as I can breathe. I used to say to people when I was making films way back in the 70s and 80s, I said, here's how I want to die. I want to be on set and I want to say cut, print, wrap. And then just snap it. <laughs> That's it. That's where I want to go. And you know who's going to do it? You know who's going to do it? Clint Eastwood. He will do that. He will he's do gonna, that. <laughs> he's going he's gonna to take it over because he's now in his 90s. I'm only in my 80s and he's still mm -hmm. kicking ass and still taking going. names. And he's going to do cut, print, wrap, and fall over. And I applaud him. Way to go, Mr. Eastwood. You're the best. I love you. <laughs> well, I did want to show you one thing before I say goodbye. Um, was, as you notice behind me, I have quite a few VHS. I collect VHS as a hobby, and I talk about a lot of them. And I do have Kickboxer on VHS. Wonderful. I've also Wonderful. got Bloodsport. And I also have a movie that you wrote and direct directed called Warrior of the Lost World. Oh, yes. That's a sweet little film. That was a sweet, that, that, that was a, a, also a turning point film in my life because it was done where I am now, in Rome, in Rome, mm -hmm. Italy, back in 1983 with Persis Kambada, yes. Donald Pleasance, and uh Robert Ginty mm -hmm. and the great football player actor the hammer Fred the hammer Williams yes he's great and the hammer is just a great I I had been a fan of the hammer as a football player and when I was in Rome preparing this film I went to a party and Fred came up to me and said hey I'm Fred Williams I said yeah Fred how you doing man love your work he said can you write a part for me in your film I love it here in Rome and I, I don't want to go back yet because the women love me here and I love it here. And I said, oh, I, I said, just give me a minute. I went over and talked to the executive producer and I said, uh, Fred Williams wants to be in our movie. He wants me to write him a part. Can I do it? He said, sure. I went back and told Fred and said, you're in. That's how Fred got in the movie. That's awesome. No, he was he was probably there shooting something like The Messenger or something like yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, he was doing something back in the day. Fred's a great man. Just a great talent. Mm -hmm. Great, great great actor. Um, well, once again, I thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. Big thanks to you. Big thank you to the folks at Grindhouse Releasing for yes. putting us in touch. Um, I hope to stay in touch with you if I send you Anytime. an email now and then and maybe get Please. you back on the channel for any future projects you have or just to have a conversation would be great. Yeah, we'll, uh, uh, we'll, we'll do a special on uh, Borrowed Time 3 when that gets yes. out. Yes, definitely. All right. Thank you so much, David Worth, for being here. Thank you for joining us. And until next time, we'll see you later.